Thanks very much, everyone, uh, for joining uh, the session today. I hope you're all uh, settled comfortably. Um, just to start off and say, I think we should all give a round of applause. A uh, big congratulations to ourselves for making it through four days of the IGF. And especially to you all who have made it to a 6 p.m. session on uh, day, day, or technically day three, I suppose, of the IGF, um, but really four. Um, thanks, Anna. Fantastic. Um, so um, essentially for this session, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping and structure to begin with. Um, we'll be starting off with a sort of mini panel uh, discussion uh, uh, just to sort of warm up the room, get some thoughts going around. But really, we would encourage you, um, and we want to leave a lot of time for you to participate in the discussion and share your ideas um, on our uh, topic today, which is on inclusion um, in the WISIS Plus 20 uh, review process. Uh, so um, we really want it to be a collaborative uh, discussion today. Um, so essentially, just for some context, uh, first of all, the UK is preparing for the WISIS Plus 20 review process, and one of our key goals is to ensure the process is fully inclusive to the multi-stakeholder community. However, while that is our objective, we don't want to just guess at what can make the process most inclusive. We want to hear directly from you, the wider multi-stakeholder community. And therefore, that's why we've chosen to take this more interactive approach to our open forum. Now, while the focus of this session is on WISIS plus 20, the discussion could, of course, relate to inclusion in other UN processes that include internet governance, for example, uh, the GDC. So while we'll be focused on WISIS plus 20 today, there may be um, some ideas you might want to take back that are applicable in other spaces as well. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, have my fellow panelists uh, introduce themselves. So I'm going to um, pass the microphone across, and um, we'll start with uh, Mary. Oh, and you've got one there. Perfect. Okay. Um, it's morning in my um, continent. Good morning, Africa. Good afternoon, wherever you are, and good evening. Um, glad to be here. My name is Mary Uduma. I coordinate the West African Internet Governance Forum. I am part of the African Internet Go Governance Forum and uh, had been a member of the MAG uh, um, at the UN um, Internet Governance. I also am um, the, the first uh, convener of Nigeria Internet Governance Forum. So, Internet Governance, Internet Governance, Internet Governance. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. And over to Alan next. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Ramirez. I'm uh, currently a MAF member at IGF. I'm a policymaker in Peru and I'm a university lecturer in Lima. And I'm pleased to participate here at my personal capacity in such a vital discussion. Thank you. Thank you, just because I'm going to pass it one more, <laughs> just to make sure that we're not going to uh, disturb the stand. Hi, everyone. I'm Timela Schutte. Um, I'm the Global Digital Policy Lead at the International Chamber of Commerce. For those of you who don't know, ICC is a global business organization representing over 45 million companies in more than 170 countries, so companies of all different sizes and all different sectors. Um, and why we are here, um, it's because we were the business focal point to the WISIS process almost 20, well, 20 years ago now, if you count 2003, um, and we have been um, following up on every WISIS outcome process uh, on behalf of global business ever since. Um, thanks. Henriette Esterhuisen, Senior Advisor, Internet Governance with Association for Progressive Communications, and old, which means I was there 20 years ago <laughs> when we were negotiating those outcomes from WISIS. Fantastic, thanks so much. And my name's Roz Kenny Birch. I'm an international policy advisor focused on internet governance within the UK government department for science, innovation, and technology. 
Um, so I'd just like to kick off with sort of a warm-up question. We've been hearing throughout the week, um, and it will come as no surprise to anyone that this has been said, but uh, the multi-stakeholder model is crucial all week. So just to sort of set the scene in context before we delve into more specific questions, why exactly is multi-stakeholder engagement so essential to the internet governance space? How can we articulate that? And perhaps, um, Henriette, I can start with yourself. I'm, I'm nodding because I think people say it without necessar necessarily saying why. You know, it's like, why is ice cream bad for you? Um, it's, it's, well, Tamea says it's not. <laughs> it's bad for me. <laughs> but, um, and I think that we've lost actually the substance of why. It's, it's, it's become like a brand. I mean, the GDC says they're following a multi-stakeholder process. The Secretary General is talking about making the UN more multi-stakeholder. And I think we've started using it as a kind of a, 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 a label, you know, like it's been approved. It's like it's kosher, it's, it's halal, it's multi-stakeholder. And bad policy processes are getting the multi-stakeholder stamp. That doesn't make them good policy processes, even if they are multi-stakeholder. It also doesn't necessarily make them fully uh, multi-stakeholder. So why? I think, well, I'm going to speak from a national level or a telecoms level. You know, I've done a lot of work with regulators. If you work with the people that have to comply with a policy process, they're more likely to comply with it. You might have to compromise. You know, business might uh, um, not like what the public sector or civil society want it to do in terms of regulatory uh, intervention. Um, and civil society might not, you know, want to concede. But in the end, if you come up with something that actually is known, understood by the different stakeholders, that matches their capacity and willingness Pushing boundaries, you have to push boundaries a little bit, but then you're more likely to have compliance. And I think the one thing we don't need in our environment are lots of policies and guidelines and principles and regulations that no one complies with, because then you have an unpredictable, uh, unstable environment. And as far as human rights you know, is concerned, you, you, don't, you also want understanding. And so that's the second thing, compliance, and then knowledge, understanding, it must make sense to people, and then they're more likely to, to, to work with it, to believe in it, and commit to implementing it. And then, you know, I think the third thing is, it's almost like if you participate in a process, you, you and I mean, I think maybe ICANN is a good example of that. If you're part of a process, you invest in it, and you actually invest in promoting it, and, and getting other people to be part of the outcome of that process. So it's kind of, it builds in a, a demand side angle to, to your policy and regulatory environment, which, which top-down processes simply don't have. We're going back on that. Perfect, thanks, Rose. Um, well, it's no surprise that I'm going to agree with Henriette. We, we tend to agree on a lot of things. Um, and, and she said a lot of what I wanted to actually say. So. I'm just going to bring it back to um, a business decision-making theory, uh, let's say. That there's one of the values of, uh, of a company I'm not going to name. Uh, but there's this principle of disagree and commit, right? For if you want to make a decision in any type of setting, if it's you're, you're a team in an organization and you're trying to move forward on what you're going to do, you need to hear the voices and really hear the voices of everybody in your team on how to make forward. Now, it's not going to mean that you will be able to take a decision. There are people that are still going to disagree with a decision or they were going to have a different opinion, but then somebody will take the decision and the decision will have consequences. But the te for the team to get behind that decision, as Henri had said, to have that buy-in, people need to be heard. People need to feel not just that they can talk or share, but they need to be heard. And a, a multi-stakeholder process that is effective is a process that hears every stakeholder that creates meaningful opportunities for those voices to be said, but also to be heard. And once that's done, yes, there will be a decision. Yes, we will have to make compromises, but we will be able to get behind that decision um, a little bit more um, effectively, if I can say so. At least that's, that is my hope. It works on a small scale. Uh, it, the more voices you have, the, the, difficult, the more difficult it, it gets. But I think it's worth the investment 
Um, and the example of that is the internet itself. The internet itself is a multi-stakeholder creation. Um, it had at the origin of uh, uh, an idea that came from, you can discuss whether it was a government idea or a researcher's idea. It became a business product. Uh, it is something that all of us are benefiting from and shaping every day. Um, it works. And in order for us to, to be able <laughs> to, to make the governance of it and on it, for those of you who were in the panel before, work, we need to Im embody the same principles. And I think that's why we need the multi-stakeholder model. We need to be able to buy into it, um, keep it ours, feel that it's, uh, it's all of us have our voices um, shared and heard. Um, and I think that moves us forward. Thank you. Uh, before all, I want to take a few seconds to thank you. Ross, can you reach uh, the UK government for this invitation and overall for the permanent commitment to supporting and empowering the multi stakeholder model? Uh, and let me say that uh, it is a great honor for me to, to share the panel with Mary, Timia, and Henriette. I'm sure we all agree uh, on why the multi stakeholder model is not only essential, but the most efficient way to address the internet governance process. Having said that, uh, it is a model that permanently needs to be fed with commitment from different stakeholders that could be potentially jeopardized if proper engagement is not applied. So uh, what we need uh, for the internet we want is to empower the model to get more resources, to get more engagement, uh, to be more strategic on how to avoid risks which can lead uh, to losing engagement by parties involved. Thank you so much, all. Um, and now over to Mary to cap off that question. Oh, okay. Okay. I think I have Hello. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, the, um, the previous speakers, uh, they've all said it well. And um, what I want to say is that I met the International Organization, uh, International Flora when it was um, ITU, and ITU, you have to be a member to be, to be allowed to attend their meetings. And um, it's a close, close meeting, and government to government negotiation between government to government, they make treaty. And, um, and um, all of a sudden, this uh, big elephant in the house called the internet showed up by um, research and, and those that developed it, and it became a, a sort of a, a source of concern to the governments uh, that do go into the room and make negotiations and agree on what to do and how to manage their spectrum, their numbers, and uh, they have their boundaries. And here comes the monster that does not have a boundary, and uh, how do you get everybody to agree on how to um, participate in um, in this in this new new world called the internet. So it needed for us to think out of the box and look at other things because I started hearing this multi-stakeholder approach from WISIS, WISIS, uh, the second WISIS when we were trying to come up with the with the IGF. Uh, so the buy-in the understanding, I don't know whether the government, they've really understood it, especially from my own environment, whether they really gotten what the multi-stakeholder multi process is, but the truth is that we needed everybody's voice to be heard and everybody to participate in the, in the process of making sure that we benefit from the new uh, process called the internet. And just like to me, I said, internet is an elephant. If you touch the head, you think that is all about the elephant. And you touch the leg, you think that is all about the elephant. And so many actors, so many people, participants, so is open. Is, uh, I don't know whether it's television, computer, or a radio, or a telephone. So if I hold this, this is everything, I, I can do my television, I can do my telephone, I can do my, my, even my camera. So for this, the, the process of getting everybody 
understand, everybody participate, all the actors participate, give room to this uh, multi-stakeholder process. And the, 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 the good thing is it is bottom up, it's not top bottom. Because even, even, even at the national level, now our le legislators and our government, our regulators, when I was a regulator, um, well, we do consultation not as much as, okay, tell us what you want, and we do what we, do, we want to do. But these days, the, 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 the regulator, you know, goes, ah, let's, let's have multi-stakeholder process in coming up with regulation. So those are the things we have gained from this process. So that's what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that elef elephant uh, sort of metaphor is really, really valuable in that regard um, as well. So now moving on, uh, now that we've sort of set the scene, um, uh, we'll start to dig into a little bit uh, more of the meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, so now looking at the current landscape, in your opinion, are opportunities to participate in UN processes surrounding internet governance expanding or shrinking? And how have you seen these processes evolve and what direction are they evolving in uh, since that initial summit, those initial summits back in 2003, 2005? Um, uh, and perhaps we can go down just given the microphone situation in the same order again for this one. Thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, so I think I tried to say earlier it's about better policy outcomes. It's not always harmonious. And, but stakeholder groups are not fixed. That's the one thing I didn't say. I think if we really apply the multi-stakeholder process in a way that's going to be meaningful so that the discussion and the process is rich enough and diverse enough, you need to analyze the issue that you're being dis th th that's being discussed and, and then make sure that the, the stakeholders are ready. And I think it's in that context that it is concerning that with the Global Digital Compact, there's the idea that the technical community is not uh, a stakeholder group uh, you know, in their own right, because I think that would be an example of of, of, in fact, if I was the UN and I was looking at AI policy, I would bring educators in as a particular group. Um, you know, I, I, I would bring people that are sociologists uh, in um, as a particular group. So I think what we've seen within the UN system is WISA started and evolved quite a fixed uh, understanding of what the different stakeholder groups are, civil society, technical academic, it was fluid in how it classified that group, um, business and governments, um, and we worked with that, and I think where we worked with it well, we made it more granular. We, 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 we uh, brought in women, women's rights groups, human rights groups, small businesses, you know, big businesses, and so on. Um, where we did not work with it well, I think we started treating those stakeholder groups as check boxes. If you had a business person, a government person, a civil society person, and a technical person, then you were multi-stakeholder. And I think the UN has, what it, the positive thing is that they have adopted the principle much more, I think much more widely, even in the ITU, you see much more sort of wide use of the principle of multi-stakeholder. But is it being applied? well and in a meaningful way. I think not really. Um, and then I think secondly, where we have less, uh, where opportunities are shrinking, I think also has to do with more of these discussions if moving to New York. I think there's, there was kind of a unique, as far as the UN is concerned, um, characteristic of the WISIS process, that much of it was based in Europe, which meant you had UNESCO, which dealt with culture, education, human rights and, and media, media, very important aspect of this. And then you had the Geneva institutions, you had WIPO, dealing with intellectual property, which has a huge overlap of what we do. You had the ITU, um, dealing with infrastructural and access issues, and then you have the Commission on S of Science and Technology in UNCTA dealing with, um, with the follow-up, um, and, and the human rights instruments in Geneva. So I think, so, but with more of these decisions moving to New York, you're going to have less of that, that, and also you have the the, the women's, you know, the, the some of the women's organisations and and uh, in Geneva as well. 
I think you just have less participation. It's it's much, and it's also from a government perspective, you're dealing mostly in New York with UN missions, which mean it means that your process is being really run by the ministries of foreign affairs. But when it's in Geneva, you have a, a slightly more diverse mix of people. And for developing countries, you often have the same person in the mission in all of those agencies. So there's just more cross-fertilization. Thanks, <coughs> thanks, Rosen. Thanks, Henrietta. Again, I will have to agree with a lot of the... It's, it, I think we're getting into a good dynamic. Henrietta is throwing up the balls, and all I can do is just catch them and, and maybe add a couple of things to it. Um, in terms of where have we evolved, if you were in the, the session just now and, and the future of the digital uh, governance or internet governance, um, I, I've read out how um, the paragraph in our common agenda on that, that actually came up with the idea of um, um, having a GDC, a Global Digital Compact, sets out a multi-stakeholder process. It doesn't say multilateral and multi-stakeholder. It doesn't say governments with consultation of all relevant stakeholders that we've seen in other resolutions and, and documents at the UN before. It says governments, business, civil society, technical community coming together um, to, to forge uh, a global digital compact. I think that's progress that, that, that Henriette was saying. That's the progress that, that we have come in the past 20 years. Um, again, caveat here that every single UN process still needs to negotiate its modalities and it needs to negotiate in what form, if at all, it will allow multi-stakeholder input. Um, and there's a huge array of differences in that. I mean, in a dream world, the UN would come up with a multi-stakeholder modalities and then we would all just save ourselves two or three meetings at the start of every process <laughs> discussing whether or not we want to let, let stakeholders in. Uh, that's that's one. Two, um, who are the stakeholders? I think Henriette uh, hit the nail on the head with that. Um, yes, there are the main groups of stakeholders, but none of those stakeholders are homogenous. Government is not homogenous. There's various different government agencies, government branches. Then you have parts of the government or, or parts of the administration, let's say, that need to also be consulted there. In businesses... Um, no, two, no, not, no two business is the same, no two business model is the same, um, there's different industries. We've been hearing again, we are here mostly with telecommunications or digital companies, business is a lot larger than that, and now every business is becoming digital. It's not homogenous, Still, society is not homogenous. So if you, if you want a meaningful multi-stakeholder process, I think there's, that needs to start with a stakeholder mapping of like, who are the people that are likely to um, agree with you, who are the people that are not likely to agree with you, who are the people that should be at the table but don't even know about these things. So I think there's another um, element there that, that we need to need to discuss of, again, what does multi-stakeholder mean in, in a true, uh, effectively applied, meaningful way. Um, I think those are the two things that, Henriette, you've raised and, and, and I really, really agree with. A third thing that, that I think I want to add to this is the layers of decision-making, the layers of governance. Um, we talk a lot about the international level because we are in an international setting. Has the multi-stakeholder model trickled down um, to regional, uh, national, sub-national levels um, of, of decision-making, of discussions on this? Um, and have we matched it with adequate levels of capacity building of all the stakeholders that need to take part of it? including governments, but also the um, businesses, uh, civil society, others that might not kn even know how to be part of uh, a multi-stakeholder conversation, um, or that they can be part of this multi-stakeholder conversation. Uh, I fully, uh, fully agree with uh, Andrea and Timea. Uh, of course, we live in a more connected world also in the digital governance sphere. So today I find plenty of opportunities for participation in the UN process from different stakeholders. Uh, maybe from the government perspective, uh, I think what uh, United Nations leaders and governments need to get more involved uh, with the process uh, with solid evidence of how the model benefits public problems, uh, allow, uh, addressing public problem problems and allows the exercise of human rights and so on. 
Thanks, and I think just some initial reflections there as well. Um, definitely hearing sort of the different, uh, perhaps cultural differences between Geneva and New York in the UN sense uh, there, and also um, how important it is to be proactively engaging um, uh, different groups, including not just looking maybe at these groups in specific boxes, but understanding those nuances as well. Um, so I'll hand over to Mary. After Mary goes, we're gonna do a quick rapid fire last question. So just to get your wheels turning now, um, we will be asking for a bit more participation um, from the audience quite quickly. Um, so um, start thinking about what points you might want to make and include. Um, but Mary, to finish us off on this question and we'll do one last rapid fire question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, where the, the UN processes is shrinking or expanding. I will say that um, the UN agencies have been running with the WISIS uh, outcomes and they have their own um, community and they've been trying to bring in so many of, uh, of, um, uh, of their actors within their own confines. L let's look at the UNESCO and let's look at the ITU or the untied, the trade. So they, they are opening their doors now. They've been opening their doors, and uh, I, I would say that it's not shrinking. Uh, if anything, they, were, they are co-opting more people, uh, more actors into the, their own individual processes that feed into the, the global. And that's, uh, I, I think that's what informed the Secretary General to look at, uh, look, can we look at the, um, global digital compact, so everybody, uh, uh, all all the actors will come in. And uh, but on the other hand, when we look at the processes, for instance, the ITU, there are some actors that we have not seen. Some some of the of the of the of the stakeholders, uh, as uh, Timia said, who are the stakeholders that are not as prominent. When we started, we had a lot of. I can people all over the places, the the the, the business, um, you know, who are who are looking for, you know, uh, their bottom the bottom line, that you know, so that um, they could they could get it. Oh, but but I don't know whether they are still as large as that when it comes to ITU. I mean, I, I, IGF processes. Uh, we don't see most of them, and um, we also find out that um, the government as well, some governments are not appearing here in, in IGF, maybe language issues, though we have been trying to, <laughs> to, to, to move forward from there, thanks to the, the, the UK government that um, sponsored the, the translation in, in uh, the UN languages. So there are still people that, there are still the communities and stakeholders that are not here that we need to bring into the process. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary, for those insights. Um, so last quick rapid fire question for the panel um, before we open it up more broadly is just simply, we've pointed out some challenges or opportunities here, what can we do about those? Uh, how can we act on those observations that we've made? Are we equipped to address the challenges that have been raised? Um, so I'll start it going uh, this way with Mary first this time and we'll come down that way. Yeah, um, consultations, collaborations, those are things, those are two words I think we should look at. Um, and also the grassroots at the national level, are we, are, we, are we having a preparation, which is preparation, uh, which is uh, preparation at, uh, at, the, at the national level? And at, the, at national level, you can see there are so many other actors within the government, the department, foreign affairs, telecommunication, uh, education, all of that. Um, I think preparation from that level will help to send the conversation, the, the conversation will get, get to, to do the actors that will be participants at the, at the, uh, at the next uh, um, uh, level of um, uh, which is plus um, 20, right? So that preparation is very, very key. Um, when, the, when we were to do the WISIS, uh, WISIS in 2003, there were 
preparatory meetings. Uh, I could remember we went to Ghana, and I don't know whether the uh, governments and um, uh, um, countries are still doing that, or blocks like the, the, the African bloc, the West African bloc, even the, the Commonwealth. I think that we were doing some preparation. I don't know whether that is still going on. I think we have to do, have the conversation and discussion, debate at that level and know what we are going with to, to the global level. Thank you, Mary. Um, Alan, over to you next. Uh, thank you. Well, I want to propose uh, applying a prospective method to address the challenges that will be raised in the future, uh, maybe now. First, we need to identify what the emerging risks uh, are that can re jeopardize the multi stakeholder model as we know it. And the second is to evaluate how probably the risk is to happen and how impactful uh, it could be. With that uh, identification, uh, which is objective, uh, strategies for mitigation need to be applied now for all the stake uh, st uh, stakeholders interested and involved in that. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Well, just another analogy, <laughs> if you allow me another one. Um, when you're trying to bring in new voices to a decision-making process or, or even raise up new talent in an organization, people say you need um, mentorship and you need sponsorship, right? You need mentors that tell you uh, how they have done it, what they have learned, how, how can you apply that? I think there's a lot of that going on around this room, um, with taking stock of, of what were the good lessons learned, we're seeing uh, how some uh, processes have done it and, and what we can learn from that and what we can apply. Then you need the sponsors. The sponsors, and I, and I don't mean that in a financial way, um, the sponsors that speak up for this when we're not in the room, where we are in those processes where we are not being let into. There are some of us that are there uh, that know different ways of doing things. We need to count on their, them to carry the flag. And, and I mean, since we're in a UK open forum, the UK does that, <laughs> and thank you for that. Um, but I think um, we need more of that. Um, and I think in order to expand the multi-stakeholder model and to get that down to the layers that I was um, telling, um, talking about earlier, um, we, need that, we need that sponsorship. Um, otherwise, we were going to talk to each other in this multi-stakeholder eco chamber, and, and we will be sitting here 20 years from now, still thinking what we need to do. Um, thanks, um, uh, Tabea. Thanks, Ros. And thanks for doing this when we all are so tired. It's very brave of you. Um, I, I think um, don't use multi-stakeholder process as a shortcut, don't use it as window dressing. It will just discredit what is in fact a very powerful way of making policy. And I see everyone doing that actually. Um, be serious about it, otherwise just don't do it. I mean, there are other ways of making policy. It's not the only way. Um, so if you want to do it, do it well. Um, we talked about, Tamara mentioned stakeholder mapping. I think the one thing that none of us have maybe explicitly said is to look at power. And, and don't assume that power doesn't play in multi-stakeholder process. It does. Global North, Global South power, rich country, poor country, big company, small company, local civil society organization, big global advocacy civil society organization. All of those dynamics, gender dynamics, race dynamics, they, they all play out in these processes. And if you're really serious about your multi-stakeholder processes, acknowledge that. Don't abuse it. Actually design in order to, to, to counter the, the, the impact of that, or at least be very explicit about it. I think transparency about that is also important. I think clarity of purpose is important. Not every multi-stakeholder process is the same, and design according to that. And also assess what you want out of it. Design it in such a way that even if you don't achieve consensus, you achieve relationship building. You deepen understanding of why there are differences. And then, sorry, and then, and, and then be flexible and adapt according to. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you so much um, to the panelists. Um, now, uh, I'd like to move us into discussion and challenge us all to start thinking about um, potential answers to these questions. 
So I'd like to challenge you to turn to your neighbors around you, um, hopefully someone new you might not have met before, and start the conversation. How can the WISIS Plus 20 review process be shaped to encourage more inclusive participation um, from the multi-stakeholder community? So I'm actually hoping that lots of you might not know the people around you, but turn to your neighbor. Perhaps we can take five minutes or so. Those online, um, I think there's about five of you. Perhaps you can discuss in your own um, breakout group as well. And uh, let's, let's get the wheels turning. Great. All right, everyone, let's come back in. If you've moved seats around, I know a few of you have, feel free to come back. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, well, now's an opportunity to sort of reconvene after those discussions. Hopefully, we've got some good ideas going. I certainly saw lots of interactive conversations. But does anyone want to be brave enough to go first? I may call names um, otherwise. Jimson, yeah, please. And thanks for being brave. Oh, yeah. Pass the microphone. <laughs> Whatever thank you're comfortable with. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, uh, very excellent uh, interaction. Thank you very much for bringing this up. Well, uh, first to say that uh, what matters to everybody is their economic standard, okay, their well-being. When we started in 2003, the global GDP was just 50 trillion. But today, it has more than doubled. And ICT, WISIS has helped a lot. In fact, in Nigeria, it, it used to be a hundred billion you know, dollars GDP. That was in uh, 2003. But now, it has increased fivefold to about 500 billion. So at the same thing, it is the WISIS activities because government change direction and involve everybody. So how can we increase that? Which is the crux of the matter. First and foremost, we need this to continue from the private sector, I'm speaking from private sector perspective. Private sector and the public sector, they have a common purpose to boost the welfare of the people. We, can, we know how to create jobs. As Tamir mentioned, we can create opportunities. So when we work together, we'll create more opportunities. So to get more people to come in, uh, because it's expensive for private sector to self-fund to come in here. So uh, what we try to do in Africa, for example, is to bring in all stakeholders together in uh, Africa so that we could have some focal people to speak for us for Africa. Just as Tamir is here, he's representing us. We, at times we don't go to New York, but she goes for us, okay? So that kind of uh, mechanism we have in place, then also we can encourage, as we discuss, that uh, organization like maybe ISOC, uh, they can do, do create more awareness within their system, engage, they are technical mostly, they can engage other stakeholder group, okay? Maybe more government, they still engage other civil society in, the, in their area of influence, and then create budget line. We need to have special budget line for inclusivity, okay? Uh, we are doing that, we see how the gov UK government is supporting uh, this event as well, so we need more of that. So there has to be a budget line, because if there's no budget line, then you can't really do much. So this is where I will stop for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really good point, I think, too, about uh, people reaching out and going to places, not putting the onus on people to all go to necessarily um, travel, to, travel to New York um, for discussions, things like that, but that proactive outreach, really interesting. Uh, uh, sorry, there's Local a point I need to make. You know, there are a lot of hubs that uh, this IGF is encouraging. Like in Nigeria now, there's a hub following mm. many proceedings. So we can encourage more hubs yeah. so that more pers people can participate. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Um, Tracy, I yeah. see your hand up. Hello. Yeah, so I was um, thinking, I've been thinking a lot about this for the last few years. When we come to these meetings, we see, who do we see here? Same people, okay. getting grayer getting older, yeah. <laughs> yeah. every now and then 
we have a new batch of people coming in through ISOC and others. If they stick around, we're happy. If they're not, they disappear. So how do we keep folks engaged? And the reasons why I think that we don't do well in this is because, you know, we're talking to ourselves a lot, right? So we are the IGF, we are WISIS. Come to us. Come and talk about the internet. But we don't go out. We don't go out to them. Because in many of the countries, the internet is not a priority. Right? So we have, first we have the, the, the unconnected, so we have that group. Then in many countries, the internet is still a luxury. We have issues, we have road issues, we have, in, in my, we have climate change problems. And the people, when they're trying to gravitate to issues to participate in, they're gravitating to issues that affect them. Right? So if your island is sinking, then the internet is not the, the issue that you're dealing with today. And you have no water, it's not the internet. So how do we reach out to people who are, can be engaged? And I think there needs to be a really concerted effort from the UN and others to reach out, to an outreach, right? That's the word we're talking about. To get to those people who are not involved, get them involved. So you don't have to come to these meetings and nobody's saying come to Kyoto, but get them involved in some way. And uh, if they're not connected, Use other means, use um, radio, television, write a letter. This is what, what does the internet mean for you? How do you engage people that way? I think we're not doing well in that at all. So we'll still have 8,000 people coming to the IGF, and of that, a few of us, well, a, a few of the same people coming every year, and then next year it's a, it's a recycle. Another, you know, go to Riyadh, there'll be another, you know, from maybe local people coming in, et cetera. So how do we reach out to those people? I think we are not doing well in that way. And if you're doing bottom-up, engaging and getting, getting into the topic, you know, how do you engage in the bottom-up? I really think there needs to be a better job at this because it affects everybody. It will affect everybody. And if we look at the other areas like um, the, the climate change, you know, issues, I think they do a much better job at engaging their their stakeholders because it means something to them. So we, we probably haven't really done a good job at saying that internet governance means something to you, you know, because if you haven't explained the topic very well, so it's, it's what is it exactly? What is internet governance? What does it mean to you? My colleague next to me asked him, how did he get here? So he's, he's new, relatively new. Someone told him, right? But if he just, if no one told him, he would just be, I guess I said, riding a bike or whatever they're doing, whatever you're doing home. And what's he doing now? I'm writing, well, I don't, there's something going on Kyoto, I don't know about that. So how do we get that, that resolved? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tracy. And I think, you know, you make the point generally, but it's especially true, isn't it, sometimes of UN processes. If you're going about your day, you may not even be aware of what's going on. And so I think a really pertinent point um, for that specifically as well. Um, did I see hands over here? I'll go to you next and then uh, yourself. Thank you. I'm Mina Komori Tayega. I'm from the University of Sussex. I'm academic, and then also my field is complete, not really completely, but I'm a trade policy expert, internet trade, I'm a trade economist and lawyer. So it's a, but uh, the reason I come here first time, IGF, it's uh, because of trade, all these trade agreements is including all the digital trade provision. That's, I'm really had worried about this in the society and economic impact on it. And then um, I, I, I have been learning a lot, you know, coming here and, and then uh, looking at things from the com different side, but in, this is internet community. And the, the thing I would like mm -hmm. to make is uh, even a stakeholder means even an academic, academia, you know, I'm in a different field. So this is really interesting to so, so the engineering, also um, trade lawyer, to trade economist, whatever. These are the, uh, we try to work together, interdisciplinary mm -hmm. approach. So this sort of the different field, the communication from the different field is really important. This is one thing we are talking about. And uh, so, so my colleague is also the first time here. And we we talk about you know we learn a lot you know this is really excellent approach. But uh, on the other hand, well when you talk about the um, 
uh, plus 20 something. I never heard of it. You know. uh, wha what is this panel about? So, the <laughs> so the I don't know this UN, you know, the approach. And then the other thing is, I completely agree with him. That's the how to the, the voice. This is my from here. Is we did not talk anything about it, but um, my personal view is um, um, that voice should be voice to be heard. But that voice, we require the knowledge, especially internet, really technical, and then also the um, sponsorship. As somebody said that the money for <laughs> to just to get that <laughs> knowledge and then also institution and um, here I, when I look at all these participants mostly Western you know countries oriented and then more still and even the local that um, Japan is now that sponsoring it but I could see very little contribution from the Japanese you know organization, civil society organization, or whatever, and then I was wondering why is that? And then the shocking thing, for example, one thing is um, um, consumer organization, Japan consumer organization, they don't, there's no people who had knowledge with internet and consumer things. So who, who, who can represent for this? You know, there's mm -hmm. no, no knowledge about this. So this is really critical thing, you know, Come and then talk to us, but they don't have anything to talk about. And then just, I want to learn, I want to learn, you know. Then they also that there, there's no awareness in general, that the very limited awareness Absolutely. in public. So this is a point. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, no problem. I think it, this is a really engaging discussion. Yeah. It's, it's hard to have a time limit, but I, I might just go ahead. Before I come to yourself, and I'm very sorry, I do want to acknowledge our online participants as well. Um, uh, would anyone from the breakout group online uh, like to um, make some points uh, from their discussion or perhaps my colleague Marek, who's online moderating could as well um, uh, summarize for the group, uh, who, whatever's most comfortable. Yeah, I'm happy to summarize quickly. Um, yeah, so we had a, a, an interesting discussion that um, brought up some points around the barriers to access, um, both in terms of kind of cost to participate in some of these um, kind of global internet governance meetings and the kind of related um, costs and barriers to, to physical attendance in a meeting like the IGF, um, as well as the kind of administrative um, burdens, whether that's restrictions on travel or kind of processes like visa applications. Um, and so I think that um, we kind of talked about some of those challenges to having more inclusive uh, processes um, and, and kind of highlighted the need to think about different channels um, for consultation and, and inclusion of stakeholders beyond solely kind of physical meetings um, as well as kind of virtual meetings and, and other types of coordination mechanisms. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Marek. And thank you to our online participants for um, participating in the breakout group as well. Um, and finally, um, over to yourself. And then we'll conclude with some uh, closing remarks, but um, over to you first. Thank you. Uh, my name's Greg Shatton. Tracy, I'm one of these newcomers that you've been hearing about coming to IGF for my first time, but I... I <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I've been involved with ICANN since 2007. I've been to 30 ICANN meetings. I've been on yeah. uh, you know, a dozen working groups. But, um, you know, as, as I've uh, kind of changed my focus there, that's why I'm here. I started out in the private sector. I still spend my daytime in the private sector. Uh, but um, having been the president of the intellectual property constituency for three years, I left that side of the world. Sorry, Jimson. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, now in uh, at large, um, where I'm the uh, chair of the North American Regional At Large Organization and also the president of ISOC New York. So I have absolutely no excuse not to be more involved than I already have been with the GDC and with the UN in New York. Uh, and I, you know, Jimson and I were talking about the barriers to access to information, capacity, uh, development, and the like for uh, civil society and for individual um, end users. And so, um, I'm going to make somewhat of an offer, which is if there's anything that ISOC New York can do, and while ISOC Global is a technical-oriented organization, 
Some of our US chapters, especially New York and DC, as you might imagine, are very policy oriented. Um, so if there's anything that we can do to help to provide a project, a home, uh, online, uh, we have the uh, indefatigable Jolie McPhee who can put anybody online at any time. Um, and he's you know, part of our ISOC New York cabal. You know, we can do something to help to provide a hub, a project, a, a space, virtual or even physical. Um, I have my, my day job, I have a law firm which has you know, some conference rooms and whatever we need to do. And we're on 42nd in Lexington in the Chrysler Building, five blocks from the UN. So if there's anything I can do to help to provide some form of a um, node, a nexus, for any of this stuff through the capacities that I have, you know, I'm more than happy to do that because I like the idea that something's finally happening in New York instead of Geneva because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I was born on the island. I'm, that's, that's my <laughs> island. So uh, I think, you know, I want to make it work and not make it feel like all of a sudden we've lost the Geneva um, kind of... Uh, environment and that there is the New York environment is kind of cold and unfriendly because New Yorkers are only cold and unfriendly until you ask them to help you and then they're as warm and engaged as can be so I'm asking to help you thank you thank you so much and I think we can all really help each other I think too. Um, point out I would encourage those even if you're new to this space t tell us what we can do to be more inclusive um, you know, it, the onus is on us to come to you, but don't be afraid to reach out equally, I think. Um, uh, we have to work together uh, in this process. And with that, I'd just like to uh, pass over for some closing remarks before I'll formally conclude the session um, to uh, the Deputy Director for Internet Governance um, at the UK Government Department for Science, Innovation and Technology to um, just make some closing comments. So thank you. No, and, and thank you, Roz. Um, and I think it's a real achievement that here we are at sort of between six and seven on day four of the IGF and actually a really good turnout and a really animated discussion as well. So I want to thank you, Roz. And I also want to thank your fellow panelists, uh, Mary, Alan, Tamea, and Henrietta for, for sharing your time. Um, so the UK government, you know, we, we've, we've organised this session really committed to, to multi-stakeholderism and that's going to be so important as we've got the, the WESIS plus 20 process and before then we've got the Global Digital Compact and the Internet Governance Forum is a, a really important vehicle for that and my, my sort of one reflection, I think Henrietta, you sort of spoke about uh, window dressing and I think it's really important that we don't. We use the, the M word of multi-stakeholderism a lot, but I think it's really important that we mean it. First of all, just to make sure that it remains credible, but also if you want to enact change, you need to bring people with you, and it's through it's through listening, not just hearing, and making a reality of multi-stakeholderism that you can make change happen and make change stick. So it's a it's a false economy just to sort of pretend or doing it in a window dressing way, you, you're probably just better off not doing it at all. So if you're going to do it, do it properly. And certainly that's the commitment of the UK government. Uh, but I'll stop there. It's late, but Ros, back to you. And thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Paul. And I think, I mean, just to say what engagement, 7 p.m. at night. Uh, if this community is anything, it is engaged. So thank you for your time today. Um, thank you for your um, excellent commentary engagement. I think lots of us to take away, lots for us to take away. And I mean, certainly um, we will be doing, as Paul says, all that we can to ensure that this WISIS plus 20 um, review process is fully inclusive to the multi stakeholder community um, and with that I'll leave it and I think it might be reception time um, if I heard correctly. So.